All right, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, start it off. Hey, everybody, uh, thank you for joining in on um, the Marine Institute Graduate Society seminar series. We meet every week on Wednesdays at noon. This is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel where you can find almost all of our seminars over the past couple of years. Before we do start, I want to provide a land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Biafic and the Allen Indian land as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Biafic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nanatiavet and Nanatukavet and the Inuit of Natasanan and their ancestors as the original peoples of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. Uh, so, so now please join us in welcoming Dr. Carl Walters. I hope I don't embarrass him with this, uh, <laughs> this introduction. Uh, Dr. Walters is a professor emeritus from the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries at uh, University of British Columbia. I, I literally can't say enough about Dr. Walters. His work in population dynamics and stock assessment are a staple in modern quantitative fisheries courses with adaptive management, age structured assessment, virtual population assessments, ecosystem-based modeling. I mean, basically everything you learn in PopDi and uh, stock assessment courses, Dr. Walters has helped push it forward. Um, and the reason why I knew that is because I was going back through my courses I've taken and I was looking through the papers that were assigned to me. They were, half of them had Dr. Walters in those, in those papers. Um, so I could go on forever about his influence in fisheries and his many accolades, but I'd much rather let him begin his presentation. So with that, Dr. Walters, I'll hand it over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Colin. Okay, well, I'm going to talk about, uh, take you through a little story of my experiences here in BC and trying to figure out uh, the impact of pinnipeds on some of our BC fish stocks. Uh, just a little preface to this talk. Uh, there have been a lot of major fish stocks around the world, and there, and at least some of them, like the northern cod off Newfoundland, we pretty much know were due to overfishing. But some researchers, especially here at UBC, would have you believe that the main cause of fisheries collapses has been overfishing around the world. That assertion is actually false. Uh, only about half of the major collapses that have been well documented can we demonstrate to have been due to fishing? Uh, and the others were at least, the collapses were at least initiated by factors other than fishing. And that's gonna be the, certainly the case for fish stock collapses here in BC. We've had some really bad ones that I'll talk to you about. Uh, and none of those, as far as we can tell, were caused by overfishing. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about herring in BC, uh, the Georgia Strait sport fishery, my favorite fishery, uh, some sockeye stocks, and so on. Uh, other fishery scientists would have you believe that the main cause of fish stock variations and collapses is uh, bottom up effects of climate change and that top down effects of things like predators can be ignored. And I hope to convince you that that's not. A good sound argument. Uh, I started working at UBC in 1969, and uh, within a month of moving to Vancouver, I went out into the Har Vancouver Harbor and caught my first coho salmon. Uh, that this chart from my textbook shows what happened to that fishery. The Georgia Strait sport fishery is one of the most valuable fisheries in BC. Uh, actually, probably the single, was probably the single most valuable fishery. When I started working here about 1970, the uh, sport catches of uh, Chinook and Coho salmon were uh, approaching a million fish a year. Uh, and there were about a million days of angling effort worth probably six to eight hundred million dollars to the local BC economy. And I started doing actually doing research on the uh, Georgia Strait stocks uh, here about in the mid 1970s. And shortly after started doing that research, we started to see a decline in in the abundance of the fish and in the catches. 
And uh, when the decline first started, we used the standard explanation. We thought we were looking at an overfishing problem. But a whole series of fisheries regulations were introduced. We closed our commercial fishery for the salmon. We put in all sorts of sport uh, fishing closures and so on like that. N none of those re reversed the decline. We then turned to blaming habitat loss, but a big proportion of this catch is coming uh, from uh, fish hatchery production and hatcheries aren't subject to habitat loss. And we also can't document any real habitat loss. There hasn't been any. Uh, hatchery production was going up during this time. And so we blamed the fish hatcheries for uh, spreading diseases and so on. And uh, that didn't work. The hatcheries had stopped growing by the mid eighties here, but the stocks kept going down and down and down. And then uh, around 1990, when, uh, when fish farms started, uh, we started blaming fish farms. There was only one person around, a sport fishing representative who was out on the water all the time fishing about 200 days a year, a guy named Wayne Harling. And Wayne started in public meetings saying, we've got a seal problem, we've got a seal problem. Every time he went out fishing, he saw huge numbers of seals. He saw them eating salmon, taking them off his line. But most of us didn't take any of Wayne's uh, warnings about possible predation impacts seriously at all. But then in, uh, in about 2010, uh, a biologist named Peter Elisiak had been doing survey monitoring since the early 70s of uh, seal populations and uh, sea lion populations along the Beak Sea coast. And he showed that the population sizes had grown dramatically uh, with the onset of marine mammal protection after the 1970s, uh, both of seals and of sea lions. And uh, Peter did a variety of studies on how much they eat and so on. And he started warning that they could have a big impact on, on fish stocks. Peter also did a really interesting thing called a stock reduction analysis where he took historical catches and used those to back calculate how big the seal population had to have been all the way back to 1880, right about the time of the final collapse of our First Nations populations. And what he showed was that back at, at, at that time in, in the late 1800s, the uh, seal and sea lion populations were much lower than they are today, that were uh, at unprecedented abundances for probably the last several thousand years because First Nations people intensively hunted seals and sea lions until their populations collapsed due to smallpox epidemics in the late 1800s. So we're looking, he convinced us that we're looking at an unprecedented situation to, just to give you an idea, the, the magnitude of this possible impact is that the stellar sea lion population now consumes about 300,000 tons of fish a year. That is greater than the catch of all of British Columbia's fisheries combined, including salmon aquaculture production. So there's potentially a very large impact out there. And when we look back into the really old commercial catch statistics from the 1880s up to the early 1920s, uh, there were huge sockeye fisheries back in these early days. There was a huge amount of fishing effort in the late 1800s, but they didn't catch Chinook and Coho. Those big fisheries saw very few Chinook and Coho until the 1920s. 10 or so when the Chinook and Coho catches build up to their levels that they were then sustained until the uh, 1990s. And that buildup in the Chinook and Coho populations coincides with uh, Peter's calculation of, uh, of when the seal populations were reduced dramatically by culling, um, mostly by uh, government culling programs back uh, between 1900 and 1920. 
So this really got me thinking, and we started to try to look at, uh, to redo some of Peter's calculations and look at the numbers, uh, his numbers in other contexts. And that most of what I'll be talking about is gonna be based on, on the work that Alicia did to uh, monitor and count uh, benefits. Uh, we've tried to assess uh, Finipad impacts on several stocks using two main methods. For Chinook and Coho, we have uh, direct estimates of fishing mortality rates during the first ocean year uh, after they uh, enter, uh, at, when after they smolt from uh, massive coated wire tagging programs. Uh, we code wire tag about a million Chinook and Coho juveniles every year. We monitor those tags to estimate uh, survi uh, survival rates during their first ocean year. And so what we've been doing is looking, one of the things we've done is to look at statistical comparisons of how those mortality rates have changed uh, with changes in pinniped abundance. So or the increases in mortality rates that we see in the coded wire tagging data uh, been correlated with space-time changes in uh, uh, pinniped numbers. And the other thing we've been doing is doing direct calculations of predation rates using prey abundance estimates and estimates of pinniped consumption rates and diets. So as you say, or could they be eating enough to account for the measured mortality rate changes? Okay, I gotta warn you about this. Uh, three things can go wrong with these methods. Uh, the first one is that mortality changes are also correlated with other factors that are exhibited long-term changes like water temperatures. So seeing a correlation of mortality with any one factor like pinniped numbers doesn't imply causality. Uh, the second thing is that uh, there's an issue called non-additivity. We can't be sure that the fish that we see in the stomachs of pinnipeds and use and can calculate how many were eaten based on that, that we can't be sure those fish wouldn't have died anyway. It's possible that those fish are being made vulnerable to the pinniped predation by factors like disease. And that if the pinnipeds hadn't eaten them, uh, the disease would have killed them anyway. That's called non-additive mortality due to predation. Another thing, though, working in the opposite direction is that predators can kill fish without eating them uh, by uh, triggering uh, fear responses or risk-sensitive foraging behaviors that can trigger the fish to spend less time foraging or to forage in suboptimal areas. And that foraging changes can reduce their growth and survival rates uh, even more than would be predicted from any direct calculation of how many are consumed by the predators. So you got one, one possibility that the predators aren't, aren't generating additive effects and then another possibility that they're generating even bigger effects than we would assess from how much the, uh, we, we calculate that are being eaten. Uh, so let me turn back to this Georgia Strait sport fishery that I showed you the picture of. This is an extended picture of how the fishery collapsed, the catches collapsed and fishing efforts collapsed over time. And compared to the pinniped abundance estimates for the Georgia Strait area, the seal abundance estimates, it's pretty obvious that as the seal population grew, the fish stocks, the abundance of fish in the Georgia Strait collapsed. This decline in abundance, we now understand, was due to decline in the first ocean year survival rates as measured by coded wire tagging. The first ocean year survival rates went right down at the same time that the total abundances and catches went down. When we were doing our early work and looking at impacts of factors like fishing back here in the 1980s, we didn't look at or didn't have these coded wire tag survival rates to tell us that what was going wrong was with the survival rates of the fish within a few months after they uh, first entered the ocean. 
So we took the survival, the survival rate estimates I just showed you, we converted them to natural mortality rates and then plotted them against the abundance of seals over time. And we find a very high positive correlation between the mortality rates measured from tagging and the abundance of seals. And the blue lines here show you the calculated or predicted relationship based on uh, our seal diet and the estimates of the proportion of the, that these fish make up of their diets. So both uh, direct cor correl correlation and calculated consumption rates from diet data and abundance of the predators, both, both say that it's quite possible that uh, increases in pinniped caused mortality were responsible for the declines. Uh, there's been a concern because we actually monitor survival rates for a large number of different stocks around the Georgia Strait, different hatchery stocks where we can apply these coat of wire tags. And all the coho stocks show the same basic pattern with, of increase with seal numbers, but when we look at the Chinook stocks, we see a much more variable pattern with uh, some stocks showing strong responses and other stocks showing no clear correlations with mortality rate uh, with seal abundance at all. So, we, after analyzing these data, we proposed an experimental reduction in seal abundance and tried to calculate what would happen uh, using models of, of seal population size if seals were knocked down by 50% and kept at a lower level for some time. And we, we built a simple spreadsheet model where we put the historical uh, stocking rates and uh, calculated juvenile numbers of Chinook and Coho entering the Georgia Strait into the spreadsheet, uh, put in uh, fishing effort to predict catches over time, and fitted this simple spreadsheet model to the data. Uh, so these are data on catches and the solid line here is the model fit to the historical catches and exploitation rates and, and spawning escapements plus terminal catches and sport fishing effort, which we predict as a function of the abundance of fish available to them. Well, th this model says that if we could just reduce pinnipeds by about 50%, we wouldn't see a large increase in the number of salmon out there. That's not enough of a reduction to do that, but it would bring uh, salmon abundance back up enough that we would see a dramatic resurgence in sport fishing effort, which is where the economic value of the fishery, of the sport fishery comes from, is the effort that people spend money to go fishing and generate jobs and things like that. So this model was used to generate proposals to government for, uh, for seal harvesting, and I'll come back to in a little while. Uh, let me turn to another example here where we're even more worried. Our single most valuable fishery in British Columbia historically was for uh, sake salmon from the Fraser River. Sake salmon, the Fraser River shown here has uh, about a hundred distinct stocks of sockeye salmon that spawn in different streams that run into the Fraser River. And the sockeye spend a year in lakes and then go out to sea. It's a wonderfully diverse biological system. Uh, we have data on the abundance of the sockeye going back to the mid 1880s. And uh, back from 1880s till 1913, there was a strong cyclic variation in the abundance of the sockeye because of a, what's called cyclic dominance in one of the main runs. Then we had a major collapse due to a, 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 a landslide that blocked the access of the fish to the Fraser River. And then after that, there was a slow rebuilding of the stocks back up to uh, what actually was near historical levels, but with the two big stocks having their peak years in different years. And then it turned around and started declining again with what we call the off cycle lines declining much faster than the, than the peak lines. 
exploitation rates through the history of the fishery here, an interesting point is that over the whole time the sockeye were recovering, these exploitation rates were all higher than the optimum exploitation rates for the stocks. So the stocks actually were recovering while they were technically being overfished. And then in, uh, in uh, the mid 1990s, we uh, instituted a policy of major reduction in exploitation rates on all of our salmon fisheries in BC, aimed at reversing declines like this one, and also uh, trying to sustain biodiversity by ex using exploitation rates that the weaker of the hundreds of stocks that we have, that, uh, that the weaker stocks could be sustained as well as the bigger ones. Now, what we got suspicious about seeing these low years going lower and lower while the high years seem to seem to remain high. That's we started looking when the sockeye come back to the coast from the open ocean. They come in through mostly here around the north end of Vancouver Island and down and right off the north end of Vancouver Island is one of the largest concentrations of stellar sea lions in BC. There's about 20,000 of them hang around in this area right around where the sockeye migrate on their return, through which the sockeye migrate on their return. So we, we started doing calculations of how many sockeye these, uh, these sea lions could be eating uh, during that relatively short time while the sockeye are migrating back. And to our horror, our calculations showed that the mortality rate that the sockeye could cause was in recent years as high or higher than the mortality rate that the fishery has caused, especially on these low return years. Uh, and for one stock for which we actually monitor the ocean survival rate as a, instead of the overall life cycle, we can show that as the stock size relative to sea lion abundance uh, decreased, there was a, a big increase in the mortality rate of that stock, of that stock as well as uh, the mortality rates being positively correlated with the number of uh, sea lions uh, over time. Well, this indicates that what we're seeing with sake is what was called depensatory mortality. Depensatory mortality happens when a predator can eat about, because it's efficient at foraging, can eat about the same number of prey, even when the number of prey at risk to capture goes down. So you got the same number eaten and a declining number at risk, the mortality rate, the percentage of fish that get killed goes up. That's called depensatory mortality. It's a very dangerous phenomenon in biology. Depensation can cause extinction of populations and a variety of other really nasty effects. So now uh, let me turn to another case example where we think these depensatory impacts have been really severe. And that's with herring in BC. The herring fishery in BC started back in the early 1900s and it built up as a reduction fishery until the mid 1960s when exploitation rates were huge and the fishery collapsed basically due to overfishing. Uh, so the fishery was closed and then stock started to rebuild and the fishery was reopened as a, a much more valuable uh, Roe fishery with roe being exported largely to Japan. And when this graph was produced, the roe fishery was healthy and uh, there was a publication that indicated that uh, there was likely a very good future for this roe fishery here in BC. Well, when we look at what happened after that, and we look at how it was distributed and what happened spatially, there are uh, five major herring spawning stocks in BC. Uh, one, one of them is up here on, on the east coast of Haida Gwaii. And that stock collapsed pretty dramatically in the, uh, in the in 1990s. 
another stock in the Prince Rupert area that didn't collapse, then a stock in, in the Central Coast that collapsed pretty dramatically. Uh, a big major collapse on the west coast of Vancouver Island. All these areas where there were collapses had large uh, wintering aggregations of stellar sea lions right in the areas where the herring spawning occurs. And these sea lions very obviously were targeting herring during the herring spawning season in February through April. And having an easy time of finding the herring because the herring are highly aggregated before they spawn and they hang around these spawning aggregation areas for about three months before they spawn. The one exception, real exception to the decline was the Strait of Georgia here that maintained really high abundances all the way through the, uh, from even, even the reduction fishery, the population didn't decline that much. And there are hardly any stellar sea lions that until very recently go into the Georgia Strait. So when you look from place to place along the coast, there's a, and calculate the changes based on changes in the numbers of sea lions that we estimate we're using these different herring, we're targeting these different herring spawning areas. We find that the, the areas that had the biggest increase in mortality rates calculated from likely con food consumption rates by the sea, by, by sea lions were the ones that had the collapses were, big, were, the, were the areas with high natural mortality rates uh, in recent years with high sea lion abundances. Uh, the fisheries in those areas where the collapses occurred have been closed for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, we monitor on the herring stocks back going back into the uh, back in as early as the 1950s. We, we monitor age composition of the herring stock quite closely, take large samples from all the areas. And so we can look at changes in the mean age of the, of the spawners, and we can directly calculate mortality rates from the uh, age composition patterns in the spawn survey data and, uh, and catch compositions. So we can see in these stocks that had the collapses that they were all associated with declines in average age and big increases in natural mortality rate evident directly from the herring age composition data. When we plot the changes that we measure in natural mortality rate of herring during the times when they collapsed, against the predicted sea lion predation mortality rates calculated from sea lion abundances, we find an almost perfect correlation that the biggest sea lion increase was on the west coast of Vancouver Island where the mortality rate increase was most severe, all the way back and the other areas array out to the Strait of Georgia where we predicted mortality rates were very low and observed mortality rate changes were negligible. We didn't get any change in the age composition of the Georgia Strait stock. Well, just as an encouraging sign, we are seeing uh, recover recoveries in the last few years in these areas that did have the worst collapses uh, in Haida Gwaii and the west coast of Vancouver Island and the central coast. But the recovery has been after a much longer delay than expected given the fishery closures. So, the data that I just showed you come largely from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and researchers in the Department of Fisheries and Oceans who study sea lions and seals and salmon and herring. And have been studying them. A lot of those guys have been studying them for almost as long as I have. So the question is, why has uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Science and Management Program 
largely ignored pinniped predation impacts in its policy planning. We've had a number of major policy statements about management of BC fisheries in recent years. None of those policy statements even mention the possible role of pinniped predation, despite what their own data say on, or telling them. Well, I think there's three reasons for this. One of them is there's a lack of objective science in the Department of Fisheries and Ocean Science Program. Uh, some of the scientists have been trained to look just for bottom-up effects and not to look for effects of predation. So they look for causes of decreases and ups and downs in food and climate data only. Uh, there's others that just don't appear to be able to do the basic kind of calculations that I just showed you. You know, how many could they be eaten? and how based on how many predators there are and how much they eat. Uh, a lot of people don't see in DFO science don't seem to be capable of that kind of complicated mathematics. And then there's other scientists, key scientists in, in key positions in DFO on the Pacific Coast who have personal commitments to particular hypotheses about how climate factors have uh, this particularly have influenced our fish stocks on the coast. Uh, another another reason why they're ignoring pinniped impacts is, is cautious fisheries management. Uh, there's an old saying that what fisheries managers do is try to minimize the whinge. They look for policy options that create the least, the least public outcry. And I think there's a strong fear in our fisheries management community of a very strong negative reaction from uh, animal rights and environmental NGOs that we know will scream bloody murder if there are any reductions in, in pinniped populations. Another one is just fear of failure. Uh, it, because of the reasons I mentioned, it's possible that pinniped predation hasn't been uh, additive and other factors have actually caused the declines. It means that pinniped reductions have to be viewed as an adaptive management experiment. And fisheries managers tend to be extremely fearful of any kind of experiment like that, uh, for which they aren't sure what the outcome will be. And then there's also, it, it's easy to pass the buck by uh, insisting on endless scientific reviews and complete scientific consensus on the causes of things before taking any action, which we cannot do uh, in this case. There's only one way to find out whether or not predation mortality is additive uh, on particularly salmon populations, and that's to reduce the presumptive cause of the of predation and see if survival rates improve. There's no way we could go out there and monitor forever and, and not know uh, what was going on without that kind of experiment. And then I think we've got a fairly large number of people who have serious personal ethical concerns just about killing marine mammals. They just don't want to see that as part of public policy for personal reasons. You, you can't blame them much for that. So right now, my basic conclusions about pinniped predation is that uh, there's three basic policy options. Uh, we could do continue to do what we're doing now, and that's just to allow the populations to remain large and to adopt radically precautionary harvest policies like complete closure of our herring fisheries and almost complete closure of some of our salmon fisheries in order to deal with the, the reduced survival rates that we're seeing. Uh, another option would be to just treat marine mammals as the same way we would treat any other fishery an unregulated uh, open access fishery and we don't allow those so let's directly control the fishery and then we call the stocks. Fortunately there's a third option we have here in BC and that's to try to restore the First Nations marine mammal harvesting system. There's considerable interest in our First Nations communities in BC uh, in commercial harvesting of seals and sea lions for uh, meat and hides and other products that uh, can uh, valuable products. Uh, our First Nations people have a traditional right 
to continue to harvest marine mammals. Any First Nations person can go out and get a permit today and shoot a bunch of seals and sea lions. But that permit only allows them uh, to kill the animals for food and ceremonial purposes. It doesn't allow them to sell uh, the th seal products that they, uh, uh, the seals that they kill commercially. Well, DFO has adopted this first strategy of uh, blaming stock declines on other factors. Second strategy, marine mammal abundances would be extremely unpopular and an unnecessary choice. And there are active proposals for restoring the uh, First Nations harvesting system. And uh, DFO has been sitting on those proposals for years now uh, and has uh, refused to allow commercial harvesting even under the permit system that exists. So what we need in the Georgia Strait and the rest of the BC coast right now is, is not more data more data is not going to solve any of our problems. More scientists running around out there monitoring the situation as it is today isn't going to help. What we need is this bold management experiment. And I, for the rest of my career and the rest of my life, that'll be what I'm going to be advocating is that large scale management experiment. So that, uh, that concludes my basic story. I know I ran through this fairly rapidly and skimmed over some really complicated data. And so I'd be happy to answer questions. And uh, as I, I mentioned at the start, uh, Colin has my presentation and you can get it from him and look at the data in more detail if you're interested. Thank you very much. That went quicker than I expected, Colin. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, that was great. Um, you actually, it's funny, we had Billy, we had Dr. Billy Christensen uh, last semester. Give him yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I have coffee every morning, and I told him that I wouldn't be available this morning because I was giving this seminar. Yeah. And he said, oh, yeah, I did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he, uh, he basically, he said some of the same stuff you did. He has a little bit of a... A little bit of frustration with uh, DFO. He was very. He was. He was meeting them in the middle, and he knows it's not their fault. There's a. It's a big machine. But yeah. anyway. <laughs> um, okay. So. Um, so if if we have any questions, anybody can enter it in the chat. I see there's one already. Let me see if anybody has hands up too. So you can raise your hand. And uh, and unmute yourself. Um, yeah. It looks like. Let's, let's do the chat question first, because that popped up immediately. Okay, I can't see the chat. I'm still okay, sharing I'll ask my you. screen. Should I stop sharing my screen now? or do you, um, you can you can keep it up just in case people have questions about your slides specifically. Oh, sure, okay. Um, or if you want to see everybody's blank screen, you can close the, <laughs> the presentation. Oh, um, okay. mm. uh, is it anticipated that markets exist to absorb levels of First Nations seal harvests that would be required to reduce seal populations to desired levels. That, 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 that has been that's a really good question, and it's one of the main issues that DFO has raised about allowing a commercial harvest. Uh, as you know, uh, commercial harvesting of seals is being encouraged now on the East Coast to try to reduce seal abundances in areas where it looks like they're having. Uh, severe impacts on East Coast cod stocks off the south coast of Nova Scotia and in the uh, in the uh, southern Gulf of St. Lawrence particularly. And what they're finding on the East Coast is that they do not have the markets. They're not able to market the seal products, the, the very large numbers that they're talking about killing on the East Coast. We don't know here on the West Coast. Uh, and what we've argued is that the only way we can find out is to start doing some harvesting and see if we can uh, sell the products. We do know that we have markets for seal meat from mink farming groups. Mink farming shut down now due to COVID, but it'll come back. Uh, China has indicated interest in buying uh, seals and sea lions. They, they like to eat them. The Chinese like to eat everything. Uh, we can probably sell some 
omega-3 fatty acid oils. Seals and sea lions produce a super high omega-3 quality uh, uh, fatty acids that can be used in various food supplements and so on. And the local First Nations people are keen on trying to develop markets for other products made from hides and other seal uh, products like uh, seal boots and things like that. But yeah, we, we don't know if we, if, it, if we can develop a viable commercial harvest. But we've actually getting a growing number of First Nations people. It's already we're really happy because we're fishing people and and we want to keep our commercial and recreational harvest and First Nations harvesting options. So we, we may just go out and kill these things for you anyway. So we'll see. But very good question. Yeah, thank you. I see, I've seen uh, the Pacific Balance Marine Management. It's like a group of people. I don't know if you've heard of that group, but I think it's Haida Gwaii, uh, or, or it's one of the First Nations people. But I always get on them because they always put pictures with a seal and they're advocating for seal harvesting, but they always have like a target on the seal's face. I'm like, don't do that. You're, you're going to scare people off of the harvesting. Like, uh, now, anyway. if you if you look at the uh, at the text of their proposals, uh, you'll note that some of them are very well written. Hmm. Guess who? Oh wrote yeah. Them? Okay. 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 I see. That makes yeah. sense. Some of them are, and some of them aren't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The stuff, there's some pretty crazy stuff that I didn't write, but they're taking yeah. their basic line right straight from a big, my big proposal that I wrote for another outfit called the Pacific Balance Pinniped Society. Um, okay. Yeah, rather than marine oh. management. Yeah. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, one of the things that's hurting us in BC is that uh, the those First Nations guys that have that that particular proposal you talked about and the guys with the other big proposal uh, are admitting that the main aim is, is to rebuild salmon stocks for the sport fishery and other fisheries rather than to build a, a viable First Nations harvest system. Right, right. Um, uh, so I saw Aaron Adamek, uh, with the hand first. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Walters. It's great hearing you speak again. Um, something, something I'm wondering is over the same time period that the seals have been going up, I think the whales have been going up as well. Mm -hmm. And there's some recent stuff that's, or some recent papers have came out suggesting that whale consumption rates are three times higher than what, what we thought they were. And I'm sort of wondering if if we had a seal call, are we simply trading seals for whales? Trading seals for whales. That basically, uh, if there's less seals out there eating herring, then there's more herring available for the whales to consume. Uh, yeah, something like that is likely to happen. In fact, another trade-off like that is that uh, argument that seals are not by knocking down Chinook salmon are having a, a severe impact on the southern resident killer whales that depend largely on Chinook salmon as their main food supply. Uh, the whale population is increasing uh, and it looks like it's increasing rapidly, particularly in the Georgia Strait. We've done some calculations, so a lot of the same thing we've done for the seals and sea lions of what their possible consumption of herring and other uh, small uh, uh, fi small pelagic fish is, and uh, it does look like it's possible that yes, that the that the whale populations could be having a growing impact on on particularly the Georgia Strait population of uh, of herring uh, and perhaps other small fish. It also looks like we're doing some work on the uh, shrimp fishery in the Georgia Strait, where some of the most dramatic increases in uh, whale use have been. And uh, the, there's a collapse in that shrimp fishery coincident with the appearance of a large number of whales in the Georgia Strait. And those whales, well, they're targeting two things. They're targeting small, uh, small pelagic fish. They're also targeting a krill and it looks like at the time when they're foraging on krill down near the bottom, they're also getting a lot of shrimp. 
can't prove that from the diet data, but the spatial overlap indicates that they're probably impacting uh, feeding in a way that would impact the shrimp. So yeah, who knows? We're also seeing in increases in, uh, in dolphins and uh, so on as well. One yeah, of the just big, well, another worry we have about the uh, reducing seal populations, people have argued that this could have a negative impact on the transient killer whales that have been building up in abundance along the BC coast for over the same period that seal populations increased more of the coastwide transient killer whale and marine mammal eaten killer whales population has uh, been used in the Georgia, uh, the, the coastal areas. Uh, it looks like the uh, the transient killer whales use seals as a way of training their juveniles in how to kill marine mammals. So mom will take uh, her little transient killer whale juvenile and take him to places where he can nail a couple of juvenile seals easily. And so uh, there's a worry that uh, transient killer whale population could be negatively impacted by uh, by seal and sea lion reductions. We don't, I don't think so. There's lots and lots of nice big fat marine mammals for the transient killer whales to eat, even if the seals were reduced somewhat. Yeah, no, right. it just it sounds really messy, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you opened a real can of worms there. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, Dr. Tyler Eddy, I saw your hand up. I'm looking at the wrong camera here, but uh, thank you for the talk, Dr. Walters. And uh, this is relevant to a lot of the things that uh, people talk about here in Newfoundland as well. Uh, I was just wondering, you touched on it a little bit in your previous question, but talking about some of the diet estimates of the seals and um, given that the numbers of seals are increasing, but the, the numbers of salmon and herring are decreasing, presumably, you know, there's another major prey source that uh, they're utilizing. So just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. And then I've got a second, I've got a second question, but maybe we'll just I'll I'll leave that one first. Well, I actually had a slide that I shouldn't have deleted. I was trying to shorten my talk. It talked about that. What what does support the uh, the seal and sea lion populations in BC? Well, the answer is there are two main diet uh, diet components: are uh, herring and ache. Uh, herring about 30% coastwide or 40% of the diet of both sea lions and seals, and uh, hake about 40% of the diet, and the rest comes from a variety of other species. The hake populations are large uh, on the coast here, and the uh, impact of the sea lions and on them is small. And, um, most of the herring stocks. Uh, impact is, uh, as, you, as you saw, is highly variable in space. Uh, but there's this depensatory aspect of this that the sea lions can still continue, and seal, sea lions in particular, can still continue to get a high proportion of their diet as, as uh, herring, even when herring abundance is driven way down because of the way they're targeting the dense spawning aggregations of herring. They can still find uh, and make herring a high proportion of their diet until herring abundance gets very, very low, lower than it's actually gone. Okay, and if I may, I've got a second follow-up question. Sure. Um, so you kind of suggested that this indigenous Harvesting of um, of pinnipeds was perhaps a mechanism that allowed these salmon and herring populations to persist at higher levels. Uh, is there a historical sort of situation, maybe when that indigenous harvesting was lower, where uh, higher numbers of salmon and herring and um, and seal populations may have coexisted? Can you think of that sort of situation, or would it always be sort of uh, I think the, the archaeological evidence has been that uh, well, when uh, when First Nations people first invaded from Siberia and moved down the coast, and a really important point is that they were not fishing people. They were hunting people. 
And so hunting and their, and their main diet from early, the earliest middens in North America up around the Bering Sea and so on is almost entirely marine mammals. They came around across that Bering land bridge. They weren't hunting caribou in that, they were hunting marine mammals. And as they spread down the coast, that spread was marine mammal hunting. Salmon didn't even invade the rivers after the, and spread out through the rivers of British Columbia until probably about 5,000 years ago. Before then, uh, the, 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 there weren't any rivers, right? The, the, the Pleistocene was a pretty violent time for anybody to be a salmon along the BC coast. The salmon culture appeared about, uh, and fishing culture really didn't appear till about 5,000 years ago. As far as we know, populations of First Nations people were stable or growing over most of that time. And they, uh, from midden evidence and so on, they still continued their hunting traditions. They still prized uh, marine mammals. They also actively killed and drove marine mammals away from their fishing operations. So they drove them away from their fish traps. They uh, killed them when they got anywhere near the fish traps. They drove them away from the river mouths. It's quite probable that they drove them away from some herring aggregations that they were harvesting from and drove them away from the oolicans, which we think uh, marine mammals are also doing a serious number on and are a really important traditional food source for First Nations people. Uh, the first big hit on that First Nations population that we know about took place in about 1862 with the first smallpox epidemic spread by the Russian uh, uh, sealers when they came down the coast. That killed about half of the population. Then we think that the population then declined slowly as populations that have been hit like that do until 1886 or so when they were hit with the second smallpox outbreak. So there uh, could have been some rebuilding in marine mammal populations between 1860 and uh, 1880 when we can first uh, get a direct estimate from Alicia and his calculations of the uh, numbers around being about half what they are today. So that half number may actually be higher than what was around before the First Nations uh, were, uh, were first decimated. My bet is that if we could turn the clock back to 1800, that we would see seal and sea lion populations down at around 20% of what they are today, rather than 50%. Okay. I think they were That's... even lower uh, over most of that uh, recent five, several thousand years. They were really valuable creatures and they, they killed them wherever they could, right? Right. I didn't realize the uh, the history of the salmon and how it related to the um, the settlement of BC, but that's, uh, yeah, the salmon, that's a really the interesting salmon story. Yeah, the salmon quite late in the history of, of, coloni of First Nations colonization. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk and for your answer. Been trying to follow that stuff about the First Nations, and we have a couple of students, Billy's Christensen students in particular, who are uh, actively working on uh, on the trying to reconstruct early uh, First Nations harvest patterns and, and utilization of uh, of uh, marine mammal resources of all kinds, but mammals in particular. Cool. Yeah, I, I, that's funny because last week I just got a book on indigenous clam gardens um, in the BC area. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but uh, so so Kaylee Brennan in the chat asks, uh, she says, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, do you think competition between pinnipeds and herring or salmon for common prey species could be a factor influencing mortality rates for these fish stocks? Uh, no, the, when you... Uh, in the Georgia Strait, where we've seen the most severe salmon declines in Chinook and Coho, which are the herring eaters, the other salmon species leave the coast and this is not an issue with them. Uh, but Chinook and Coho definitely target herring. And the Georgia Strait, right, where the biggest Chinook and Coho declines occurred has 
the half of the total British Columbia herring stock. It's got a huge herring stock that has at its, high, its highest abundance ever was around 2010, well after the collapse. Uh, during the uh, that peak in, uh, in catches that I showed you in the Georgia Strait of Chinooks and coal occurred during the time of lowest herring abundance, right after the uh, collapse of the of the herring reduction fishery. So very definitely, no, there is not a competitive interaction issue there. The fishery, in, in other words, the fishery is not uh, taking away the food of those salmon. We've seen declines in the salmon growth rates and in herring growth rates that parallel the increase in pinniped abundance. But what that suggests is not that the salmon are running short of food, it's that they're afraid to feed. So we think those declining growth rates are this ecology of fear reaction, a foraging reaction to increase predation risk while foraging. Along with some size selective uh, removal of the larger fish by, by the mammals. Right. Selectively sort of take the biggest ones I can, especially when eating herring. All right. Uh, is there anybody with another question? This takes a lot of pressure off of me because usually I'm the one who has to ask all the questions. Go <laughs> mm. on, guys. You don't want to be like our UBC graduate students and sit there <laughs> in, in Billy Christensen's class. And they never ever ask questions, and Billy keeps begging them to ask questions, and I help him out, and I beg them to ask questions. <laughs> I, I'm ready. Go uh, ahead. I think we have another. Yeah, we have another question uh, from Aaron. Yeah, sorry, if no one's asking questions. I'll sneak in another one. There's uh, another one, uh, Aaron. Before you ask it, I see a hands up by Tyler Eddy, or is that? Oh no, uh, that was an there. older. I think oh, okay. Tyler. Okay, so I think on your first or second slide, you mentioned that there's been no habitat loss. And I was wondering if you could clarify that because I've been reading some stuff saying that we've lost a lot of river habitat with the logging in BC. <laughs> we did lose a lot of habitat back in the 1800s and early and early 1900s. Some of the early logging practices and urbanization did destroy a lot of habitat. But we've had major habitat restoration programs and major habitat protection policies in uh, along the BC coast for a long time now. Uh, one of the things we can do is actually using the same coded wire tagging data, we can take our uh, salmon escapement data and use the coded wire tagging data estimates of escapement per smoke so we know how many smokes go out and we know how many codewire tags end up as escapement. So we can we can back calculate how many smolts had to have gone to sea based on our escapement data and the codewire tagging data. And what that shows us is that for the Georgia Strait area where we've had the severe declines, if anything, the number of wild smolts, Chinook and Coho smolts enter in the Georgia Strait has gone up, not down. And that couldn't happen if there'd been severe habitat uh, degradation around the Georgia Strait area. Habitat degradation is a less serious issue up in the North Coast uh, where we have not seen salmon uh, declines, Chinook and Coho declines. Okay, so I, 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 we, we can very definitely rule out. People still keep bringing this up. They talk about the three H's habitat, hatcheries, and harvest as the main cause of salmon problems. Uh, they're wrong on all three counts, right? Hatchery production has been going down for quite a while and it hasn't resulted in any improvements in survival. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, habitat isn't being lost. If anything, it's being added to habitat restoration programs. And harvest has been cut back to nothing. Almost nothing. But do do you get any problems? Like we had the big, there was the big heat wave last summer where 
I mean, the Law of Rivers got extremely warm. So, like, it seems like the the like the actual the trees around the streams of the forests are getting better protection from logging, right. but yeah, they're getting they're, warmer water. Well, there, there's um, we do not we do not see a clear and progressive warming trend in over long periods of time in the streams. Uh, we do see extreme events in the streams like that heat wave or like I think probably more importantly was the huge floods that we had this fall that uh, washed out uh, salmon spawning from quite a number of streams in the, uh, in the Fraser Valley area east of Vancouver. Uh, the one place where we actually have direct evidence about the effect of warming on coho salmon was an experimental logging program that took place on Vancouver Island back in the early 70s, where they logged a watershed called Carnation Creek in order to demonstrate the negative effects of logging on salmon. And to everyone, and they did see negative effects on uh, pink and chump salmon that spawned down near the mouth of the watershed. But to everyone's surprise, the coho salmon population not only did not decline, it increased after logging. And the best hypothesis about that increase was that the warming of the water associated with opening up the forest and taking away the forest cover improved coho growth. And that improvement in growth resulted in higher survival rates in fresh water. So the opposite of what you'd predict if you assume that warming always has a negative effect. So the freshwater ecology is changing, no question about that. Uh, fresh up patterns are changing and so on, but we're not we're not seeing it in the abundance of Chinook and, and Coho juveniles in the areas most potentially most impacted by such changes in the in the southern part of the province. Okay, thank you. All right. Are there any more questions in the chat? I hope not. And in that case, I might be able to go catch Billy for our morning coffee. <laughs> yeah, oh, wait a minute. Good. No, Billy, Billy, Billy had to go to Costco this morning. They have a seniors moment at Costco for us to shop safely. Okay. Oh, nice. <laughs> Actually, yeah. I got. <laughs> I was just in Vancouver for a conference, uh, CCFFR. Yeah, oh, you did. That's... Yeah, and uh, that's where I got COVID. Yeah, so. there you go. That's why you didn't see me. I think, I, I think I'm just getting over it. I didn't even bother getting tested. Yeah, you know, what am I going to do? <laughs> why bother? It's either going to nail me. I'm almost 80 years old. Uh, or I'm going to go through it like I think I just did. So it's time to stop worrying. Yeah. Um, so, if you had anything um, to say, I mean, I, I guess this whole thing is kind of a a, a statement to DFO, really. Um, but if you had anything you could uh, say to DFO uh, in terms of anything you could implement at DFO, would it be um, indigenous harvesting, or would it be commercial harvesting uh, through throughout? Like anybody can apply for a license for commercial harvesting. Oh no, no, I would definitely. Th this is a First Nations thing. This is a First Nations tradition. It's something they've done for millennia. Uh, it, it, the fir first right of refusal for anything like that, uh, like a com any kind of commercial harvesting, really has to go to them. Uh, just a, a matter of basic human decency. They had so much taken away from them illegally and, and wrongly that they should get first first track. The, the first Pacific Balanced Pinhead Society proposal actually did call for uh, an all, what, what, what do they call it? all fishermen uh, commercial harvesting. They wanted to allow purse seiners in particular to uh, to do seal harvesting because a purse can uh, set up off a seal rookery area and kill a whole lot of animals and bring them on board the purse efficiently and process them and uh, you know store them efficiently. Better to have that kind of con 
big big boat harvesting system and have a bunch of guys running around the small boats shooting a seal here and there and then having to try to recover it and get it to a processor and you know the logistics of of the commercial harvest would be much simpler if it was done but there's a whole bunch of first nations people who have seen it more than enough to do the job yeah, that makes sense. Them, at least real eager. Yeah, and oh yeah, for sure. Turning, uh, uh, per se, no owner is Tom Seward. I, I was just going to say his name. Literally, <laughs> yeah, Tom every, Rager, every five days or so, I see his name. Yeah. And he'd, so he'd quite happily use a First Nations per se book as the, the basic uh, attack system. Yeah, yeah. And that makes sense to me. I, uh, that's funny that you mentioned him. Um, I'm on the the Facebook group, the uh, the uh, West Coast Fisherman, and I see him all the time. <laughs> so uh, Tom's a real character. There, he was part of the original Pacific Balance Pinniped Society development, but he had a, a falling out with the other directors, hmm. uh, and uh, split off and and did his own thing. And uh, it's a real shame that that happened. He's a it's an interesting character. They're, all of those guys that push forward those proposals are inter very interesting people. Yeah, so um, I would I would feel like if there was any uh, market open for um, pinniped harvesting or any market for pinnipeds, um, if harvesting was to go ahead um, for a commercial, I would think that there would be severe backlash from um, the public. Uh, well, just kind of like, yeah, yeah, I feel like well, there absolutely will be. I feel like uh, that be just the howls of outrage right. led led by David Suzuki and the Suzuki Foundation and others like that, and who have been busily putting out misinformation about uh, about what's going on already in anticipation of all this. I see. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You know, it, well, what you're basically seeing here. Is the same thing that's going on with hunting and fishing, uh, and and a political thing. Uh, people who hunt and fish, uh, and uh, understand that or believe that it's okay to kill animals and so on, are are not urban people. We mostly live in and come from small communities. Who tend to be politically conservative and so on like that as well. Uh, and this really large urban population that would be outraged doesn't has lost that tradition of the use of the land. There's also really high strong sentiment against hunting. There's strong sentiment against fishing in general. There's even a bunch of people that run around saying that fishing uh, is cruel to fish. You know, hey, what do you do? Yeah, especially with sea spiracy. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but actually, that's funny that you brought it up because it literally just last night I was talking to somebody from a city, from Mexico City, and and she was trying to, she she had the belief that um, fish, uh, hunting was purely um, a recreational thing. And she's like, we don't do that. Hunting is recreational. And I, had, I let her finish out her thought. And then I brought in, like, I'm from a small town. It's Quinault Indian Nation. I'm on the reservation. Uh, we grew up hunting. It's all subsistence. It's cultural. It's you know. It's all these things. So like kind of dispelling that myth that it's all. Oh. It's a blood sport. You know. Hold on. You brought that up. You're not Quinault, yeah. are you? Yeah. Yeah. Quinault. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> you know about Ray Hilborn and I and, and the Quinaults? Uh, no, I don't. Ray Hilborn, you and the Quinaults, no. Well. Back in 1970, they were going to draft Ray. They had already drafted me, but I got out on a medical thing. I can't resist telling you this. Okay, no. So, a University of Washington prof and I arranged to have Ray uh, be a conscientious objector, and we arranged for us to supervise this conscientious objector duty. You know, normally you could get out of the Vietnam War by being a conscientious objector, but you had to go like clean toilets in hospitals and things like that. But we managed to get it so Ray got to be 
a, a conscientious objector under my supervision and your and, and it's under you ethical and where he had to do his conscientious objector duty was on the quinault reserve <laughs> so every three months or so the three of us would drive down to the quinault reserve stay at one of those fancy hotels that they have along the beach there and with, with, with hot tubs and things like that, and then meet with your ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then, that was funny. how Hillborn did his conscious objector duty. Oh my gosh, so I know the Quinault Reserve well. <laughs> That's funny, so that must have been Ocean uh, ocean Shores or something like that, or? Uh... Yeah, I think that was where we were staying, yeah. Yeah, but what That's we neat. were mainly involved with was that crazy allotment system that was partitioning the ownership of the reserve up into right. smaller and smaller bits and breaking up any ability to get a coherent forest management policy. And it was right in the midst of them just stripping the stripping the the, the cedar out of the reserve completely. It was a horrible mess. Terrible, right, I, I terrible hear about story. That occasionally. <laughs> so you, the rest of you folks. Colin comes from a, an area that just got totally screwed by the U.S. Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, for a long okay. period of time. Uh, I, there is a question in the chat uh, by Ali uh, Turgut. Uh, he said, "Thank you for the presentation. My question: uh, What might what might be the potential diseases that can make fish stocks more vulnerable to predation?" Uh, he's not from uh, the North America, and can hypoxia along BC be added up in this case? Well, hypoxia just quickly. Hypoxia isn't relevant to this to this issue. It's not a problem in any of the areas that we're we're looking at. Uh, there's a whole long line of diseases that uh, could potentially be involved here. The one that uh, people have recognized for a long time is a thing called bacterial kidney disease or BKD. Uh, BKD has the funny property that its expression is temperature dependent. So as temperatures increase, the fish is more likely to express it. And it's been thought for a long time that it's been transmitted through hatchery programs and so on like that, that what it could be doing is, uh, be, is staying hidden in the fish until they leave the hatchery and go out into the ocean. And then it may express in that warmer water and kill the fish. There's also a long line of viral diseases, including a couple of new viral diseases that may have been introduced through uh, Atlantic salmon aquaculture uh, that are now found in widely in, uh, in BC salmon. There's a major program uh, at the Pacific Biological Station in DFO uh, to uh, monitor disease through DNA and RNA activation uh, technologies. It's producing a bunch of information on the prevalence of various disease organisms. And what's coming out of that is there's a lot of things, uh, there's a lot of fish out there that are, uh, whose behavior is likely being impaired, particularly by viral diseases. Uh, the woman, if you want to look up that literature, the woman scientist who's in charge of that is this wonderful character, Christy Miller. Uh, she's got a wonderful program of disease research. All right, thank you. Um, is there any uh, other questions? Let's see, go through the hands. People are dropping out. It's, it is 15 past. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, all right. 8.45, let's call it a quits. Yeah, I think so. Hey, Colin, All right, well, Colin, great to meet you. Yeah, it was, nice. it was so and, great to meet you too, uh, Dr. Walters. Say hello to your daddy fantastic. for me and ask him if he, uh, if he might have run into me. It's I, I will, absolutely. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. I do want to end out with a, a little thing to advertise next week's seminar. Um, thank you so much for the talk. But uh, before I, I do want to introduce... Um, Next week on the 13th, uh, on Wednesday, we'll have our first multiple person presentation uh, by doctors David Keith, Jessica uh, Semioto, and Raphael McDonald. And they'll give a talk titled Spatial Stock Assessment and the Precautionary Approach. 
Uh, so yeah, these last few, the last three presentations are all stock assessment stuff. So I didn't do that on purpose. Uh, um, I think our last one is Ed Camp uh, from UF. I think you've done some papers with him, uh, Dr. Walters, or a couple papers. But yeah, Ed Camp oh, will be our last one. Ed, what's Ed going to talk about? Uh, I'm trying to remember now. I don't remember. I, 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 yeah, I have to look it up. But uh, when, when you see Ed, you got to say, Ed, call Mrs. Golden Redfish and with you. I'll tell him Redfish and okay, Doc. Redfish and with uh, Carl. Oh, I, some of my best Redfish fishing was with Ed. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Carl. That was fantastic. I yeah. appreciate it. Okay, you guys take care of yourselves and good luck with that Newfoundland weather. <laughs> I'm going to go out in the bright sunshine and have a smoke. Oh, smoke gosh. <laughs> okay, okay. Tell, tell Billy I said hi. <laughs> I will do. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Take care.